so funny because I want to be black and white and be like, no, yes, no. But I've somewhat been curious in all of these things my whole life. And I just thought, well, yeah, so what? I just, yeah, whatever. If they exist, it doesn't affect me now. That was my attitude. People ask me all the time, how did you get into this? It all started when I was 12 years old. Uh, I had my first sighting and only sighting, to be exact. And uh, I lived in Dallas, Fort Worth area, near the Dallas Zoo. And we always had stranger things because the zoo was less than a mile away. So you hear all these sounds and, and lions and tigers and all of this thing. But this particular night, right when it was getting dark, there was this uh, where the stars kind of just started meeting the sunset. And there was this white object just was, and I was like, wow, that's cool. And then behind it was two jets following it. And at that moment, I knew I saw something. Is there intelligent life out there? The existence of intelligent life on other planets is a topic of much speculation and debate. The likelihood of the emergence of intelligent life depends on a variety of factors, including the presence of water and a suitable climate, as well as the right combination of chemical and biological processes. The potential existence of extraterrestrial intelligent life raises many questions and has significant implications for humanity. So we continue to search. I knew what I was seeing. I saw it. I, I would experience it. What I understand now, it is, it is probably most likely a tall gray. And what I have learned is that I was most likely taken at a certain time. And that's, those are the times when I would see that type of tall gray is when the times either I was returning or I was being taken. The SETI Institute is interested in life beyond Earth, right? We haven't found any of any kind, not even bacteria. We haven't found any life beyond Earth. But, you know, I feel it's almost a certainty that we will find some evidence for life, uh, you know, extraterrestrial life, sometime in the next decade or so, right? After elementary school, I would go to catechism, and I used to get in trouble with the nuns in catechism because they would be talking about something, and I would tell them, no, there's much more than that. And I always, and I remember that specifically that I would get in trouble because they would say, blah, 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 it says this and, you know, it says that and this is how we teach. I go, no, it's bigger. It's bigger than that. Stand bright for me. Thank you for, for showing up. My first time I saw something that I just couldn't distinguish was probably around 12 years old. Um, I was in Northern Virginia. My sister and I were on a patio on an apartment, big apartment complex. There were a few buildings. And in the distance from us, this had to be maybe 200 feet in the air, I'm guessing. There was something passing the building that had to be, I'm guessing, at least a half a mile wide. All I saw were lights, but you can tell it was a shape, almost like a giant circle or something, but there was no sound and there was no body that I could see. And it was just during the nighttime. Uh, it, I started seeing like, okay, this is unique. This isn't a balloon. This is something unique. And even the next morning, I remember looking at the paper and the paper, everyone in the city actually saw it. They didn't know what it was. So it was kind of then that I started waking up to the idea that I'm seeing things out there that are definitely not planes or helicopters or don't know what that is. And of course it took me a while to kind of take that in and, and didn't see anything again for quite a while. Like I said, it's not as black and white for me that I, Yes, I know that I was interested. Do I have memories of all of this stuff? I don't, unfortunately. But I always know that I've been open to it. I always know that when it comes to, you know, Steven Spielberg's take on any alien, I'm always rooting for the alien. And I literally cry for the aliens, right? Because I've been told that what I channel is ET in nature. I think that some of them are probably aliens, I think some of them are, I, I mean, I think some are coming from other planets. Yeah, you know, I think we've learned how to traverse the, the distances. There, There's ways to trick the, you know, Einstein's law, you know, and it's certainly Newton's laws. And, and, and when Einstein said, I don't think God plays dice with the universe, he was wrong. God loves a good game of dice. I, I view it as a mystery. I don't know what they are. I don't know what the UFO UAPs are. We pick up signals all the time in the city. I mean, I, I sat there and watched 
uh, when we were observing down in Puerto Rico using the big Arecibo telescope, now defunct. But intelligent life, well, you know, that might take a little bit longer. You could have looked at the Earth for a long time and never found anything intelligent or more intelligent than a Tyrannosaurus Rex. I've always believed in them. I think it's irrational to think we're the only beings in the entire world or entire universe. And come on, how egotistical is that? <laughs> <laughs> right? So I think that some are coming from other planets. I think that some are, are interdimensional, that that might be the major amount of them because it's much closer to go through a portal or a wormhole to get here than, you know, across the universe. Uh, and I think some might be us from the future. Let's say they are extraterrestrial for a second. If they were, it would be kind of like a situation where we would be sort of mice in the experiment and we would be trying to create experiments as mice to prove that there are humans watching us, right? How difficult would that be as a mouse? It'd be really hard. I've been in this a long time and I've had people come up and tell me, oh, I've seen this and that. There's gotta be 30 different species. And I always say, well, look, I'm just looking for one. I don't care if there's 500, I need one because I just can't find enough evidence for that. I think that a scientist's first job is to be curious about the world and the universe around you. That's what being a scientist is. You know, when other humans don't acknowledge certain things, you get to, at least from my experience, you just stop talking about it because they can't hear it or they can't deal with it. They don't understand, so why waste your time? Because you get all these ideas from people. They're angels, they're spirit guides, they're alien, they're, they're negative, they're good you know there's so many stories that it's really hard to know and i was always obsessed with et this is something that was almost like born in me i don't know why but like when i was three years old i you know my dad built a swing set out of wood you know the way you know people weren't as lazy back in those days you know they build stuff and there was some lumber left over and i hammered it together into what i thought was a facsimile of a rocket ship had my dad all up on top of that. And I was waving and singing. And I remember this too. I was maybe just four and a half. Well, my mom said, well, who are you waving and singing to? I, I said, the space people, you know, I'm waving and singing to the space people. Here, here I am, you know, 60 years later, I'm doing the same thing, you know, still waving and singing to the space people. Now, what I can tell you though, is the Native Americans and these are two separate Native American female shamans, if you will, okay? And we we talked uh, about their culture, not the same time, two different times, years apart. And they had the same story. There was, there was f from the Native American point of view, at least from these two, there was four species. There were the blues, which were these little two feet tall and they came out of the mountains. Then there were the ant people, which we call the greys. And it's not because of their eyes or anything, it's because they came out of the ground. Then they have the snake people, which we refer to as the reptilians, which may be six, seven feet tall or maybe somewhere around there. And they're very reptilian scale, skin looking. And then the other ones are, you know, they call the giants or whatever their name was for, for giants, but what we call the tall tall blondes. Um, other people refer to them as, as, as different names, but uh, those are the ones that are ye, very human-like, probably around six and a half, seven feet tall, uh, dark, dark blue eyes, and their eyes are offset a bit. Some people refer to them as the Palladians, but so we have, those four, but what's really interesting about one of those four, besides the gray aliens, which are seen all over the world, the little guys that are two feet tall, they're seen all over the world. They're known as Menahuni in Hawaii. They're known as Leprechauns in Ireland. They're known as Tommyknockers in Cornwall, England, and out here in the US. And the Native Americans actually have their own names for the little guys too, they're two feet tall. Now that's interesting because that may not be an alien. That might be someone living here on this planet, you know, that's been here for a long, long time. Sort of like Bigfoot.
you're at, you're at, I'm vibrating at a higher frequency. My, my, so I have more of an open consciousness. I vibrate at more at a higher frequency. And you have exposure to others that are other entities and frequency at, at that level. So you're like the light and the dark. You could be seen for other energies that will see you, but they may not see others, or they, or they realize they could see you. And so they're trying to get your attention. Well, when something doesn't have a physical body to it, then they, what else can they do? They, they try to manipulate something that is either electrical, that is very easily to be tipped or, or changed to get your attention because they're like, oh my God, this person could see me. What can I do to get their attention? And so that would happen when I would go into rooms. And, and a lot of times it's because those other entities that are there are recognizing that you're there and they want to get your attention. And they're trying to communicate. They're trying to either, sometimes they're trying to tell you something. A lot of times there would be just bangs, like bangs on the door, bangs on the walls. Why is this stuff happening? Um, so I, I do believe that's also a good example of what's in the book is that these entities recognize that you could see them and so they want to be seen. And so they're kind of photobombing your, your images. But there's a certain way and there's, uh, that they only appear. Uh, the extraterrestrials especially and the supernatural especially exist in a certain frequency. We all tend to hear about all of the stories that are out there that's in the mainstream. But what about the ones that we don't hear about? Um, and these are the special stories. And the ones that really I gravitate to is more of the hybrid type stories, star sea type feeling stories where people know that they don't belong here. They feel different. They have a different experiences. Uh, and, and some of them have some type of psychic abilities uh, that is not normal. Uh, and, and so when you look into those things, they're not talked about a lot because there's probably a lot of fear behind that. Uh, but those are the stories that I think that we should look into uh, with maybe there are hybrids walking among us. The, the, the term gray aliens came about just because of the color of their skin. It's, it's a very, very off-white gray color. When you go back into history, especially when we think about the grays, uh, which is probably one of the prominent fixtures when, in UFOs when people ask, what do they look like? It, it really came out in the 40s or 1947 when the Roswell crash, when all of a sudden everyone hearing, we have alien bodies. But then there's a lot of stories that people have already told that they witnessed grace. They just had the description of the small bodies, human-like uh, figures, big, large head, large eyes. And so we've heard about those stories, but it really didn't come into the thirst for the public until Roswell, New Mexico, when they said, we now have evidence that there are small grays. You know, when I first started doing this years ago, decades ago, that was the main thing was gray aliens were clones. You take a, take a, a, a piece of paper with some writing on it or a picture and you copy that. Then you take the copy and copy that. You take a copy, copy that. Eventually, you're going to copy your your copy will be blank, you know, over a period of time, and that's what the, the original theory was. They're cloning themselves out of existence, so they're here using our biology to make hybrids. I'll never forget that I was lecturing at a conference in Denver, and I was talking about Roswell and about the artifacts we found, and, and I went into great detail on how we found it and what I did. And so after the lecture, I'm putting my laptop away in my bag, and these twins walked up. They were very, very pale, very, very light complected, but they had dark blue eyes. And I don't know if it was my imagination, but their eyes were, seemed like they're a little further apart. And the male said, well, Mr. Zukowski said, that was a really good lecture. And you're on to it, or you're on to something, something like that, or you're on to something, or, or you got it right, something like that. They just turn around and left. And people often ask me, you know, there are other kind of aliens. And, and, and I go, yeah, I mean, we have stories of Palladians. We got reptilians. We have all types of them out there. But again, the gray takes the, the, the mainstream of the stories. And I think it's because they're relatable. Uh, and we have not had other evidence that we have the, oh, what do the reptilians look like? Or we actually have a reptilian. Uh, but then the grays take the cake. In my opinion, the answer to UFOs could be all of the above and a little bit of everything. Could be that, the, you know, there's many different ideas out there about what they are, and it could be that all of them are true. Or, well, not all of them. 
Some of them are a little bit nuts, but all of the ones that are kind of within the purview of science could be true. So some of them might be extraterrestrial, some of them might be ours, some of them might be a new atmospheric phenomenon, like a really weird plasma that happens, you know? Some of them might even be interdimensional somehow, you know? Maybe, maybe these are higher dimensional objects that are crossing into our three, 4D space-time reality and uh, appearing as these things. Some of them might be time travelers. Personally, I think that's a bit a bit hard for me to buy because, you know, I've read Stephen Hawking and stuff and he uh, has some pretty good arguments against backwards time travel. You also run into a lot of paradoxes and nasty things like that, but at the very least, some of them could be extraterrestrial, some of them could be objects from higher dimensions, and some of them could be all of the Earth-based things that I mentioned. I mean, another more out there possibility is that maybe we were not the first intelligent species to evolve on Earth. Maybe it happened before in our planet's history, and there isn't much of a record of it. And that's something that has actually, like, mainstream scientists speculated about before, that there could have been a prior technological civilization on Earth before humans. I doubt that a little bit, because I would think that we would have found some evidence by now that there was some kind of a civilization before humans that got advanced enough to build something like that. I mean, there, we haven't found anything that suggests that that's true, but like, you know, I guess my point is that there's many different things that they could be. Why are they here? You know, what do they want? Uh, are they here to save the planet? Are they going to save the world? And uh, But if you look at all the wars and all the things that's happening over our history, there hadn't been any intervention for that, you know? And I don't think that that's the case here. Now, are they here for some of our resources? Probably. Uh, we hear about cattle mutilations. We hear about all these things. Are they studying us? You know, and that's one of the things that we have to really uh, look into. But I don't think they're here to save us because I think of a story of my own. And I think about, we we talk about free energy. And one of the things, being an investigator, we never seen a, a extraterrestrial stop for gas in our spacecraft. So obviously, they're not using that. But we know few rules the world. But could you imagine that from planet Zeon, he sends a, somebody comes here named Akbak and he walks into the boardroom of an energy company and I'm new on the board, right? I haven't made the billions yet. And he says, here, I'm going to give you a recipe for a free energy. And I'm going to save Earth from, because y'all killing the planet. And we might clap for a minute into the whispers. Did he say free energy? Free? Yeah. Changing the world? Yeah. And we look at the security and the, the scene goes, the door locks and it goes dark and that's it. And I think that's probably have happened. Somebody probably came to save the world. It just, the humans didn't allow that. And then of course the second expedition was called off because when back on the planet Zeon, they said, what happened to Abbach? You know, go save earth with something else. And whoever he tells his family member, I'm about to go save earth. And she says, lock the door. You know, you're not. Uh, Akbar never came back. Are aliens good or bad? And that's a that's a fifty dollar question or a five hundred dollar question. <laughs> but we do know that there's a lot of people that are coming up missing, and abductions is happening. Uh, and when you start looking at the data, uh, there's a lot of abductions that's been going on. We can't you know relate them to extraterrestrials, but it's worth looking into because we know they have a history of doing that. And that really we don't know. No, we have people who've been abducted. We've had people that have told me what they can remember from their experience and how terrifying it was and and their life was threatened and the hope. But we kind of do the same thing when we tag animals. You know, from a bear's perspective or a coyote or a wolf, you know, we capture them, we sedate them, draw blood from them, right? Maybe we'll put a collar on them and let them... So, Okay, so if you look at it from that perspective, we're being studied. Then you have the cases where people just end up missing, and especially in our national parks. 
There's a lot of people that go missing in the national parks every year and their bodies are never found. Actually, there's people who go missing all, all over the world. Is it associated with aliens? Can't say, but some people seem to think so. But until, as an investigator, I know for a fact. Now, me personally, I like to think that, that aliens aren't bad or they're benevolent or, but I will not go on an investigation without carrying a gun because I don't know. You really, really don't know. I've heard a lot of horror stories. On the flip side, I've heard stories that are very, very positive. But until you actually meet the thing that you're investigating, you never know. Uh, there's stories, obviously. Dulce, New Mexico, the base in Dulce, New Mexico. Supposedly the aliens were abducting humans and killing them and, and swimming in the vats of blood. I mean, that's one of the stories. That's how they feed or they, they're nourished. As far as I know, those are just stories. But the number one thing with any type of animal mutilation, the blood is always missing. That's the number one. That's the primary thing of an animal mutilation. It goes back to that scary story of Dulce with somebody reporting they see blood and the blood is being used by the aliens. Uh, I, I don't want it to really go there. I don't want to think about that. It's still something that you have to keep in the back of your mind when you're investigating stuff like this. Now, there's a lot of people out there going, well, you know, they're here to save us. They're here, to, you know, on and on. And going, well, they're not doing a very good job because we're like killing ourselves and we're killing our planet. So uh, I think they're here to study us. Uh, in some cases, someone may get in the way for whatever reason and they never return home. I can tell you with Travis Walton, who's a friend of mine, he, he was one of those people that just accidentally got hurt and then they repaired him. So based on Travis Walton's story, they weren't there to kill him, they took him to repair him. So that contradicts a lot of stories I've heard of them being here you know, to hurt us. One of the main caveats of all of this is, are there good or bad aliens? And just like they're humans, they're good and bad humans. So I would assume that there would probably be some aliens with a debate saying, hey, let's go abduct some of these humans. And the other graces, no, we're not going to do it. And there's an argument. And then now we have alien abductions. Now, according to the person who's been abducted, was it a bad experience for them? And they probably say, yeah, there's some bad aliens out there. Uh, but when it comes down to it, uh, I think overall, I would suspect they are. I would suspect that there's just like there's human, you know, bad humans. There are some aliens out there that don't like us and don't like other aliens. Uh, and so therefore, it's going to be common practice, good versus evil. Well, I like I like Colorado because um, a couple of places we can't kind of do with animal mutilations, which was something that I was cow mutilations, you know, mm -hmm. mutilations. And that was something that, that I'm pretty active with. But I'm, uh, I'm probably one of the U.S.'s top animal mutilation investigator. Um, I had learned that back in the 1800s there was a mutilation. And you would just find this from, from old newspaper clippings. It was out of Missouri. So animal mutilations with lights seen in the sky in about 1896 or so out of Missouri. I kind of wrote a blog uh, a while ago kind of teasing that theory that the mutilation aspect of the animal itself, the cuts and, and the missing organs and stuff, is, is just basically to, to throw us off that the animal was killed by a predator and they were actually after the blood. Now you go, well, that can't be so because, you know, there's surgical. But to think like an alien, you have to be an alien. And we don't know what these guys think. We don't know how they think. We don't know if they have personalities. We don't know if they have a conscience. We don't know. Some people claim that the greys are basically worker ants and they're just programmed to do one thing over and over again. I think there, there's a little bit more to that. I think there is some thought process and, and they, some uh, responsibilities that they can take on their own too. So I don't actually buy into that, that theory based on my investigations of what I've learned. I did think though, wouldn't it be funny though, that if they just wanted the blood, but they, they, they didn't understand us enough 
that we would be able to see through their, you know, what they were doing, that they were cutting the animal up to make it look like a mountain lion or a bear ate it, and they just wanted the blood and they could care less about anything else. They were flushing it down their UFO toilet. And I say that because I do know from all the animal mutilation investigations that I've done that the denominating factor or the main factor is always the blood missing. It's always, it's always a, a, about the blood itself. And it's not exactly, now granted, some of the cases, um, some of the cuts have been in glandular areas where maybe they were taking samples, or maybe not. The one article I read that goes way back to the late 1800s in Missouri, where there was a light in the sky and, and over a ranch and three animals were found the next day dead. The article didn't mention that they were cut up. It mentioned they were void of blood. Now there's other weird things that happen out there. Uh, one in particular is cattle mutilations. And when you think about what is happening with these cows and people tend to see the aftermath of that. Now this phenomenon itself takes a whole different turn because now we want to ask why are you mutilating these cows? Or are you studying humans? Uh, especially when it gets to a cattle mutilation, some of the five signs, one in particular, there is no uh, footprints around these mutilations. And so now we know it's not done by an animal uh, because there's nothing there to be tracked. Uh, oftentimes these mutilations have no blood uh, if though it was just surgically removed. And so people then tend to say, okay, with some cult doing these mutilations. Now we can rule that out because you know, that's just not the technology that they were going to use. When you look at some of the organs and how precisely they was removed surgically, uh, then we're talking about uh, technology. But then you see in some of the photographs, if you were to look at, there's some type of burn sensation that goes around these cattle. Uh, and so now the plot thickens, you know, what it is, that's radiation, number one, if that is, but number two, we got organs, uh, and some say, okay, human anatomy is close to a cow anatomy. So could they be studying us? The thing about aliens though, and this is where it's kind of funny, is for an alien is trying to think like a human, but can they, or how do they think? We really don't know how they think, all right? So if they think that, first off, if we mutilated an animal, we can make it look like a predator did, but we really want the blood to live. But if you really think about why do they take an animal from location A to location B, mutilate it, and put the animal back location C, which is sort of close to location A. I actually had one investigation in uh, San Luis, Colorado, where we found and I said we, because at the time my buddy was with me who was on my team. We found where the footprints ended of the cow at about 40 yards further, we found the animal. And it was only one set of footprints, it didn't go backwards, it stopped. So we, and because it had rained and the ground was wet, we knew that's where it stopped. So for whatever reason, who's ever doing this, they take the animal, they do what they want with it, and they put it back. It's like someone stealing your car taking the engine out and giving you back the car because it's still registered in your name. Now, it's really hard when you're trying to second guess an alien and how they think and why they do the things they do. So as investigators, we kind of have fun looking at it going, do they really understand what they're doing? All they see is they need this, but they don't need this. So I'm just going to take this, but I'm going to give you back that. Some rumors have it maybe they're using some of the uh, reproduction systems to create hybrids or all of these things but what we do know is 900 pounds thousand pound steers are being left on top of telephone poles which we know humans have not done that uh, we have these things showing up on the other sides of their ranches and so obviously they are being lifted up somewhere uh, obviously to probably some spacecraft but at the end of the day, uh, these things are happening. And there was one case uh, of a human mutilation that actually resembled a cattle mutilation. Uh, and this case here was known uh, quite some time as well. Uh, you have close encounter of the first kind, which is a distant sighting, and that's the most, uh, the most common sighting. 
uh, somebody will see a light in the sky that's anomalous. I call that a boring UFO, right? If you can't tell it from a helicopter or whatever, but if it shoots out of the atmosphere, it suddenly becomes a very interesting UFO, right? But that's, that's a, a CE-1 encounter. A close encounter of the second kind is when that UFO uh, affects you physically or, or mentally, uh, or psychologically. That would be like the Oz effect that I just mentioned with the family. A close encounter of the third kind is when uh, you have a face-to-face -face with beings, not necessarily, though, in a abduction visitation scenario like somebody comes upon a UFO and sees beings like gathering foliage or whatever they're doing, uh, that would be a CE3 encounter. A close encounter of the fourth kind is abduction or visitation. It's when they take you and, and you're not really in control of the situation. And now recently we've had the CE5 thing, which is people making contact through either meditation or, uh, you know, getting into a meditative, a meditative or trance-like state and calling UFOs in, you know, in. And, uh, and I do think that works. I think there are certain people that take advantage of that, that charge the public astronomical amounts of money to do that for them. But anybody can really do that. But just be careful what you ask for. There's, um, and there's even some of the members of MUFON who have this experience, and, and I've read books and, and stories about people having these experiences where can reach a level of meditation or spiritual enlightenment or whatever what have you where you sort of tune into their wavelength and they become aware of you and can communicate that way I've never experienced that myself I've talked to a few people who have I do think there's something to that um, and there's something I think to people who are artistic or musical um, or have some sort of a creative or freer mind that makes them a little more open and receptive to that contact. And I'm sure people who meditate more, even if they're doing it on purpose or not, and like I said, are more spiritual perhaps, or more open to it, um, you open a window or something where you can see and they can see. I would say for the past few years, three, four times a week, easily. I know last night I saw maybe five of them within 10 minutes above my house. So, and uh, I know some friends of mine here, I, I've shown wherever we go. Well, especially when they we start having a conversation about UFOs, as soon as I start putting that font out, those ETs can hear what I'm saying. And like it's almost like a telepathic type thing. It's I'm not talking directly with them, but they can either feel from what I'm trying to talk about or hear me. And whenever I put that feeling out, like, can you show yourself? Can these people really like to see you? If they have time, you know, because they don't, I'm not a dictator. They, they have jobs and others, but if they're around, they show up. I think that the more people look into it, you're going to the site, you're going to the actual physical place where something happened, or maybe you're going out to a spot where sightings are occurring regularly, and you become a known entity to, to them, whoever they are, and they say, oh, okay, well, there's that person. Let's keep tabs on that one. Let's check in on that one. Um, and I think that, again, puts you on their radar um, in less of a spiritual fashion, more of an actual physical boots on the ground kind of way. Um, but you're there. I think it's just like um, if you loiter around a building where there's security guards and you go by every other night, the security guards start to recognize you. They might not talk to you at first, but they know you. And if you keep bugging around, pretty soon they come and start talking to you. They want to know, what are you doing here? What do you want to know about? What are you trying to do? And I feel like that's the same situation. In the past few years, maybe past 10, 15 years, I've shown at least 20 people where they've actually shown up in front of them going, holy crap, what is that? I'm like, just look, that's them. Wave, say hi, don't be afraid. Most of the people, they're always saying the same thing. Oh, it's a plane. I'm like, it's not moving. It's fact, it's flashing light at you and it's staying right in the same, oh, it's a helicopter. I'm like, oh my God. It's so difficult getting past some of these, these like beliefs sometimes where they won't allow it, even if it's in front of them, I'm like, okay, you need to come down here and anal probe this person right now. That's the only way they're going to believe it, you know? And that's not what they're like. That's not what they're about. But some people really need a smack in the face. It's, it's difficult to break through our barriers that we have as human beings. It's really hard to say because, you know, you get this information from, from people 
who are speculating, and you have to be very careful about that. You know, if, if, if someone sees a car zoom by real quick, they're going to speculate, oh, that guy just committed a, a crime or something, and, and that's why, you know, it's speculation. When in fact, maybe his wife or her wife is going into labor, right? Or there's some type of other medical emergency, or they just happen to be a speeder. But we have that problem as humans speculating. So unless you really know, now I have talked to a, a few abductees who, who claim they can remember some of the things from their abduction and this is what they say. The problem is, is there's no proof. Once again, it's this their interpretation of what happened. And once again, when you're looking at a human <laughs> and you tell one human a story and they take that same story and tell another person and they tell another person. By the time it gets back to you, it's a different story. So it's all based on, you know, your perception, how you were brought up, you know, by your parents, religious aspects, the whole bit on how you perceive things. So as a field investigator, what puts me aside of all other field investigators is I, I try to wash all that away and I just go after the evidence. Now, if someone tells me that they've been abducted, I go, I need evidence. I need some physical evidence showing that, you know, you're not lying. And I don't think you're lying, but I still need evidence. Or if we don't have the evidence, it's just a very good story. So now uh, communication has always been on people's minds of are we being uh, communicated with? Have they communicated with us? Now, we, we break that up into two factions. Government-wise, no, it's not happening. Uh, so when Bob Salas told me at the end of our conversation, Roderick, it's time to trust the witnesses. So now if we do do that, we know they've been communicating with us. People are hearing about this. We're talking uh, in dreams, uh, whether it's uh, sleep paralysis. Uh, now we can take the next level of CE5 where you can literally summon up uh, an alien in an orb of some type of entity. So I think they've been trying to communicate with us. They are communicating with us and it is happening today. Now, they have a lot of choices from the way they do that though. There was a time that um, I would like, okay, has anyone else had these experiences, especially when you grew up as a kid? Uh, but then when I got older and then I became, um, not just an interest in the UFOs. I ended up actually being on a social media app and started a club about UFOs. And my goal was to attempt to get maybe 20 or 30 people. It turned out now it's got 25,000 people. Uh, and I started doing a weekly uh, experience show. Uh, and of course, that's weekly with two E's, not W-E-A-K. And I've probably interviewed over 400 people. And I tend to have gotten a lot of ideas that if though we're focusing on what's going on in the skies, it is time to focus on what's going on on the ground. People are really, really traumatized by these experiences. And you hear some of the most compelling stories from abductions, hybrid babies, uh, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. And in, you hear one or two and you go, OK, maybe uh, then you hear three or four five, six, seven, you're going to wait a minute. This is something. And then you hear someone from this walk of life, from this walks of life, have similar stories that could not have crossed hairs, but maybe dreamed about the same things, felt that they were contacted the same way. Now there's a, a bigger picture. My, the red flag always comes up for me when I talk to somebody and they say, well, I know exactly why they're here. And for those people out there who go, well, we know the answer. You don't know the answer until you actually talk to an alien just based on perception, observation, best guess. <laughs> but that's what keeps investigators going, is to find the answer, and that's what keeps me going. Um, I've talked to many people, and for me, I'm convinced. I might have had a bit of an experience when I was, you know, seven or eight. I kind of vaguely remember something where I saw lights off on a distance bouncing off the Graham County Mountains. And I kind of remember the next day people talking about, you know, UFOs or something. But it's very, very big, vague. And I, 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 it's hard now at my age, you know, did that really happen or, or, you know, am I just, you know, believing it happened? But the interesting thing is, is I've always had this fascination with UFOs. And later on in life, when I started 
doing serious research and going to the conferences and then starting to do my own investigations. My mom felt compelled to tell me about her UFO experience. And she had a UFO experience when she was very, very young. Because they didn't have that many rooms in her house, and she lived in Narancy, Arizona, she uh, st basically slept in the hallway on a small bed. And she remembers a couple of nights waking up at night, and she would see little humans walking around. And I asked my mom, I said, well, what did you do? She goes, she would just cover up her eyes. She would put the blanket over her like you would normally see on TV. That's what she did. And she'd seen that a few times. And she felt compelled to tell me that later on as I got older, when she saw that I was getting involved in, in ufology. What's interesting, though, is once I became a little more popular in ufology, my aunt contacted me. She was traveling from San Pedro to Thatcher, Arizona, uh, and it was late at night, and her husband, my Uncle Roy, is driving, and my three cousins were in the back seat. And back in the day, they would pull off the side of the main highway on a dirt road when, they, when the driver got tired, and they would turn all the lights off for safety so no one would know it was a car out there, and they would sleep a couple hours, and off you go. I remember that, my dad doing that. Well, while they were sleeping, she woke up, and just like you would see in the horror movies, she woke up and there's a face right there staring at her through the window, the car window, and it was a gray, an alien. And there was two more, she said, a couple of them behind. And I said, Auntie, what did you do? She goes, <laughs> she closed her eyes. She didn't, didn't want to scream. She didn't want to frighten, you know, uh, her kids. And uh, I said, what's the next thing you remember? She goes, I rem remember we're driving. So at that point, I'd done a lot of research and had done a few investigations. And so I started thinking, did she have an experience when she was a little girl about the same time my mom did? Now, when you get involved in ufology, um, if someone has an experience quite young, they tend to have experiences all through their life. It's almost as if they're being monitored or not. It's, still, it's, it's kind of hard still to believe that. Even even me being an investigator for over 35, well, 34, 35 years, you know, that someone is watching us. I develop a, t a technique called I Believe You Believe, uh, and it's one of the things that I'm writing about uh, right now as we speak, but it's, it's what I found most. People are now wanting people to believe in what's happening because this is so, uh, and, and people can also know when you don't believe the story. Uh, and so what I develop, I believe you believe, is just a way of saying, okay, you know, they'll go, Roderick, you do believe me. And, and I will say, well, you know, I believe you believe it happened to you, so therefore I'm going to explore this with you. And I think that's all people need nowadays uh, is that at least someone to go on that journey. So someone said, Roderick, behind the dumpster, the leprechaun left some coins. Can you see the rainbow? And I don't see it, but they're standing there. And I'm just going to say, well, hey, I believe you believe it's there. Therefore, I'm going to go with you. Let's go. And that's what is needed in this particular uh, arena now is more belief. I have never had a men in black experience. I, I, I've been followed a couple of times, but nothing where someone's ever come up to me. And the reason is, and I talk about this openly, you know, radio shows, even my lectures, I'm very open about it. I can tell you right now, I know of one secret military base and once the general location of one secret military base and one skunk works base, one in this state and one in Kansas. Because you do so many investigations, it turns out the lights in the sky, the things that people are seeing, are terrestrial, not extraterrestrial, and it's black projects. I know where they are, I'll never reveal it. And I say that very openly, and that's not my job. My job isn't to release information from our military bases. There's that fine line as an investigator that you do not want to cross, and that's the line. You know, um, I'm s still an American, and. And I want our soldiers to get the best benefits. You know, when they go into battle and the best technology, and I don't want to mess it up for them. Both my sons are in the military. So 
If I know something that could be detrimental to our military, I'm, uh, I'm done. I'll walk away. And there's so many investigations out here, you can go somewhere else you know, and investigate. You don't have to investigate there. Yes, I've been to the West Cape of Area 51. I've been within rock throwing distance of the tower and I waved at the guys. And that's as close as I would go to, to the West Cape of Area 51. I would never, there's no reason to have a men in black experience because I don't cross the line. And I'm very open about it. There was an investigator a couple of years back called Max Spears. And he was a Polish investigator. I don't know if, you know if you've heard of him, but he stepped over the line. And you don't want to do that. Stepped over the line, he, and he literally texted his mom and said, um, uh, I've gone too far, or whatever, you know, and uh, if you don't hear from me, release this information, whatever. Anyway, within a couple of days after him texting his mom, he was found dead in a motel room, I think with this black kind of liquid coming out of his lungs and stuff, and he's dead. So, he was a UFO investigator, he stepped over the line. He steps where he shouldn't. And that's where, as an investigator, where, where I say, I do this for me, because I don't make money off of it, I do this for me. That if I accidentally step over the line, I realize, okay, it's on me, and I'm not saying anything about it. If anybody ever confronted me, I say, oh, okay, you know, well, I'll go visit here. I'll go do that. You know, I don't need to get into your face. So that eliminates the black project or the black men in black for me. Do I know where some cases? Of course. <laughs> but, you know, as an investigator, you have an idea because of the sightings. They just don't go there. <laughs> Another part of this phenomena is always the men in black stories. I have not personally had a witness that had a, a men in black experience. Um, I've read about them, certainly, and I've, I've read up on them quite a bit. You know, it's, it's a popular subject and absolutely a thing. Um, it has happened, um, whoever's behind it. I have not had anybody personally talk about that. So I, I couldn't really say to that uh, what someone's reaction is. If a man in black knocked on my door, and I had a, some of the weird experiences that I've heard about and read about, I'd be worried about it a little bit. Now for me, I call them the big secret keepers. Uh, in this, and most of the time, we wanna really put this around the government. Okay, so we know men in black stories have been existing, that there's organizations that shows up to really take control of certain instances or encounters or crash sites or crash retrievals. Uh, but now, I think it's bigger. Uh, so what about these black projects that's out there? Now we know that this is in the private sector. This is where the real treasure for them to hide the secrets because at this point we can't go there as investigators, as civilians, uh, and okay, the military, the government works for the people. Now we have FOIAs, which is Inform Freedom of Information Act, but they don't work in the private sector and they know this. And they know that they can put the project there and oversee it, but we can never get any answers. And so those programs are going to exist. They're going to exist in the end of time. Uh, and now there's more money and more money behind it. And so let's take the men in black and set it to the side. That was just the beginning of it all. Now men in black is represented by private sector contractors, Boeing, uh, and you can just keep going on down the list of all of those contractors. Obviously, there's one thing that would make this all very worthwhile, and that is to find a signal that's actually due to extraterrestrials. And it may be that we just find fossilized microbes on Mars, right? But, you know, Mars is one place to look. We're looking. The clouds of Venus are another place to look. There are three moons of Jupiter. There are two moons of Saturn. All of these places have liquids, either on the surface or underneath the surface. And if you have liquids, and four and a half billion years to cook up something, you know, the chances that you've cooked up something aren't all that, you know, un unlikely. So I think we'll find life, unless biology is somehow extremely rare, we will find life very soon. I know about ETs, I know they, everything has a reason. Because just, I think for humanity to, the, just our path of evolution, and it, we're still evolving. You know, we're not growing new digits because now we create tools and that's how we create new digits. And, 
and, and all that, right? But I think that when we see the way that UFOs behave in our atmosphere and how they can, you know, seemingly evade the laws of physics, if they can do it, we can do it. But we'll never get there if, if we can't see it. This is a possibility. You know, my days sometime in nights going, what would be a dream scenario about this phenomenon? What would I like to see or be part of? And I want to be that one that's contacted. I want to be the liaison. I want them to say, you. we chose you uh, to represent us to them, to the humans. And, and, you know, here's the message. All right, he wants to tell us to put down the nuclear weapons. What else? Oh, okay, yeah, he, he said such and such, such and such. Oh, by the way, you know, and that would be my dream of having the contribution to humanity go down in the history books. I mean, we can be just like those that are flying these anomalous craft. That's us. If we take the right path, if we don't act with fear, if we're scientific about it, but yet open-minded enough to say that sometimes science is wrong or limited in scope, the only way for us to evolve is for that to be acknowledged, for that to become part of the human psyche, that yes, this is, you can become this. If, if you work hard, if you do the right things, if you don't kill yourselves off with, you know, by using the world as your trash heap or, or having nuclear wars and killing yourselves off. I think the dream scenario will be to understand that there's life outside the universe. We're not alone in this universe. I think that just people are ready for that information finally. And it's happening. Soon we'll be able to travel to another planet. Soon we'll be able to travel to another universe, another galaxy, uh, and have friends outside of Facebook. <laughs>